Welcome everybody to this uh, <coughs> new series of uh, GVN webinars. Uh, and uh, well, before introducing uh, Bob Gary, I just want, as usual, to make a very few points regarding the uh, Global Virus Network. For those of you who are not familiar with the GVN, uh, just to emphasize that this is a science-driven, independent network merging experts all over the world. 65 research centers are now members of GVN and 12 affiliated. And uh, our three missions are really research, education and training, and advocacy and communication. And in this context, these webinars are extremely helpful uh, to disseminate the knowledge and to provide the real expertise. And it is really in this context that uh, it's my great pleasure, great, great pleasure to welcome today Bob Gary. Bob is professor in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology at Tulane University School of Medicine in New Orleans. He's very much involved in education and training. He serves in the Tulane administration as the assistant dean and director of the graduate program in biomedical science. Bob has provided for many years a major contribution on many emerging viral infections, in particular, but not only hemorrhagic fever. And in fact, he's a program manager of the Viral Hemorrhagic Fever Consortium, which is a very interesting public-private partnership of scientists working against these uh, emerging viruses. Uh, Bob has always been a great support to the Global Virus Network. Uh, he is the director of the Tulane Center of Excellence uh, in the Global Virus Network. And he will describe his results. But basically, they are providing major insights on both the molecular structure and the immunological patterns of uh, different viral infections, including more recently, obviously, COVID-19, working a lot in Africa. Uh, and he will explain some of their studies with West African scientists and developing uh, infrastructures in Sierra Leone and Nigeria. So thank you so much, Bob, for being with us. And we really look forward to your, to your lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christian. Let me see if I can make this happen here. Um, okay. So, so I want to talk mostly today about the origins of SARS-CoV-2. And um, of course, it's been in the news a lot recently, and there is quite a few uh, controversial points that I'll, I'll try to address uh, today. Uh, but as Christian mentioned, uh, our, our lab group and my colleagues and I work on um, a number of emerging viruses. And uh, this is just from the WHO back uh, several years ago, where they tried to prioritize you know, which viruses people should look at. And uh, filovirus diseases like Ebola and Marburg, glass of fever virus were a couple of the ones that were highlighted. And um, also coronavirus is another group that uh, we've been interested in uh, over many years. So as Christian mentioned, uh, we've, we put together a consortium to look at uh, some of these emerging viruses, really some of the best uh, people across different generations of virologists and other scientists to, to look at emerging diseases. I'm really uh, thrilled always to work with this great group of people. And there's just too many of them to really mention now. And, um, and I do want to just give credit, you know, uh, when I can, uh, when when times are due. So, um, you know, we've been working for a, a long time on Lassa virus uh, in West Africa, in Sierra Leone and Nigeria. And again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. This slide just summarizes a lot of work that we've done over many years on the genomics of Lassa virus, on uh, developing uh, diagnostic tests. 
uh, for uh, this important emerging virus. We've developed mon monoclonal antibodies, human monoclonal antibodies from survivors that actually work very well uh, in protecting against this disease in, uh, in several animal models. And uh, with Erica Sapphire, another great GVN supporter, we've, we've done a lot of work on the structure, uh, structural proteins of this virus and determining, for example, the trimer structure of Lassa virus. So uh, since we do work in West Africa, one unfortunate um, occurrence was that um, Ebola virus came to us. So we're working on one hemorrhagic fever and another one came. Uh, we work actually down in this little uh, town called Kinema at the Kinema Government Hospital, which is right in the heart of the Lassa fever uh, zone. Uh, it's not that far away from where the three countries of Sierra Leone and Guinea and Liberia come together. And of course, if you, you know, we have virologists here, so most of you will know that, you know, this is the area where Ebola emerged in West Africa in, at the end of 2013. And, and some of the people that we worked with there unfortunately contracted, last, uh, contracted Ebola and died from it. Uh, other uh, people like uh, Will Pooley and Ian Crozier, who I'm sure many of you know, uh, also uh, were infected with Ebola and they, they fortunately survived. So, um, you know, being there in West Africa with a team working on Lassa virus, we were actually able to do a few things with uh, Ebola that hadn't been done before. Most of the Ebola outbreaks, in fact, all of them up to this point had been in the center part of Africa, Central Africa, uh, away from, you know, the places where laboratories were. And, you know, we were able to, you know, look at some of the early uh, Ebola patients that they came into the Kinema Government Hospital. Uh, here I have John Shefflin, who basically led this effort uh, there. And we learned a lot about Ebola uh, on the ground there. And uh, also, you'll probably also recognize some of the names here, uh, Pardi Sabetti and Christian Anderson, who I'll, I'll have more to talk about later. But um, these people, uh, when Ebola came, um, collected some samples and sent them to the Broad Institute at um, Harvard and MIT, where sequencing was done basically in real time. And this was really the first time that that had been done uh, in an outbreak situation. And so we, we learned there as, you know, it's common now uh, that, you know, these viruses do mutate. And we even identified uh, one particular mutation, this A82B mutation in the glycoprotein that was present in the Sierra Leone uh, isolates that, you know, gave the glycoprotein some special features and allowed it to infect humans a little bit better. And, and that should be familiar because this is precisely what we're seeing with uh, the SARS-CoV-2 variants of concern that have uh, emerged like uh, Alpha and Delta. And again, I'll have a little bit more to say about those at the end of the talk. So uh, one of the things I guess I'm most uh, proud about is, is that we did, um, you know, do, did flip some of the paradigms on their head. I mean, before the West African Ebola outbreak, there was sort of a, just a commonly understood, um, you know, thing that you couldn't do research during a pandemic. And I, I think what we, we showed was is that you actually have to do it. You have to learn about these diseases while the outbreak or the pandemic is going on. And uh, flipping that on its head, I think it is, is, is very important. And it was important to do that. And we've seen that in, in outbreaks since then. I mean, eggs were broken, right? But you know, paradigms were also shifted. So I think that that's important. So I just one thing about real time research. I mean, most of you will may know that there have actually been three Ebola outbreaks just this year in 2021. And, and what we learned from doing real time sequencing was is that these um, outbreaks were actually reactivation of Ebola in human survivors. And th this actually informs public health and informs, you know, things that need to be done. Uh, we actually need to pay more attention to the survivors uh, because they can be the source of new, new outbreaks. And we need to do things like, you know, see if a vaccine can prevent that or see exactly what uh, risk factors there are for this reactivation uh, or, uh, you know, coming out of latency that uh, can, can now, we you know, lead to, uh, to new outbreaks. So real-time research is, is actually important. So, so having done all that work uh, on Ebola and Lassa and, you know, traveling to West Africa to do that, you know, you get on a plane and you're, you're kind of in another, another world, another space. Um, and, um, you know, when I 
first went to Kenneth McGovern Hospital there in May 2014 when, when the first cases were coming to the hospital there. Um, the sign had already been taped up on the wall. And I really didn't expect that, you know, six years later that I'd see something very similar in my own building here in New Orleans at, at Tulane Medical Center. Of, you know, basically the same approach, just kind of, you know, a rough taping of, you know, a sign telling people about, you know, what this new emerging virus was. And so that that was uh, that was kind of hard. And um, and it's been difficult, um, you know, but I mean, there's some lessons that we learned about Ebola. Um, you know, I, and it, and what the main topic of my talk today is going to be about the origins and about, um, you know, where SARS-CoV-2 may have come from. But one of the leading theories, I guess, is uh, that, um, you know, it came from a lab there in, in Wuhan. And you've all heard about that. You've heard about our colleague, our GBN colleague, uh, Sing Lee Shi, and, you know, uh, all the accusations that have been made there. And I, I'm going to address that. Um, but, you know, the same thing happened to us in Kinema, our group there, you know, there were the people on the internet that came up and said, hey, look, there's this lab there. It's been founded, funded by George Soros and Bill Gates. Well, it really hadn't, but uh, we did get funding from NIH uh, to do our work there. And that it was a bioweapons lab and somehow or other we caused that outbreak of Ebola there. And it was really, you know, pretty, um, intense it in some places, you know, on the internet, you know, and the conspiracy theories, you know, I, I said in this quote, I mean, we had teammates that died there and then they're talking this trash about this. And in fact, PolitiFact, who some of you may know, I mean, they called, you know, some of these exaggerations of, uh, about Ebola, including the, the fact that, you know, maybe we had released it, uh, the lie of the year. And, you know, I'm going to speculate here a little bit that, you know, maybe, uh, maybe not, <laughs> probably not, that uh, exaggerations about the origin of COVID, uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 might, might even could be considered the lie of the year of 2021. So we know that, um, you know, there have been nine coronaviruses so far that uh, have crossed over from uh, animals to humans and, and two new ones just since um, you know, the emergence of SARS-CoV-2 in 2019. And I think, you know, the, the, the common wisdom is, is that, you know, we don't know very much about the emergence of SARS-CoV-2. You know, we don't know, for example, the precise intermediate animal. But I, I would make the argument, you know, compared to these other viruses, that we actually know more about the emergence of SARS-CoV-2 than we do about these other viruses. Even, even the first SARS or, you know, the first, you know, couple times that it spilled over, we, we know more about SARS-CoV-2 and how it got into the human population than, than, the, than these other viruses, even SARS-CoV-2. I'll, I'll try to explain that in a little bit here. But one thing that we do know is, um, you know, we know the, the, the proximal ancestor of SARS-CoV-2. We know that it's a bat. We know a particular kind of bat. Uh, we have a virus that's extremely close to SARS-CoV-2 now. And we know the place there that the virus uh, spilled over. And about the only thing we don't know is precisely uh, which animal that it came from. And if you look at all these other viruses around here, I mean, we don't know what the proximal ancestors of SARS-CoV-2 are, which bat, you know, MERS, not, you know, we know it comes, it, we know it's a camel virus, we know it comes into camels, but we don't know, you know, the original bat species that, that MERS came from. And the same is true for the seasonal coronaviruses and even these new viruses that have emerged recently. So we don't, know a lot about how these uh, viruses spill over to people. And it takes time and intense research to actually figure this out. And we, we've made actually some great strides with determining the origin of SARS-CoV-2. So let me just go back then, but to the first SARS there a little bit. And, you know, 2002, um, you know, it's uh, not even 20 years ago now, but, uh, you know, there was, it, it made a big splash and, and, you know, younger people may not remember, but in November of 2002, there was a cluster of cases of an acute respiratory disease in Foshan, a, a large city in China. And the disease spread around the world. It spread to Hong Kong, to Vietnam, Singapore, Canada, and Europe. They called this new disease a severe acute respiratory syndrome. And unfortunately, uh, one of our virology colleagues, uh, Carl Urbani, was uh, 
from the WHO was investigating these cases and contracted the illness and, and died from it. So this, this happens. Uh, virology is not the safest uh, field, and people do get infected with these agents while they're doing their work. But, um, the, the novel coronavirus uh, that caused this syndrome was uh, pretty rapidly identified. It was identified in several species of wildlife, wild animals that were being sold in wet markets uh, in China, uh, and they called the agent SARS-CoV, uh, SARS-CoV, uh, SARS coronavirus. And finally, there were 8,000 cases of this, a worldwide mortality of about 10%. Uh, and this virus, uh, for the benefit of the planet, was not a, a very... Uh, efficiently transmitted virus. It doesn't spread from person to person nearly as effectively as SARS-CoV-2. Uh, but it does spill over. It did spill over from the wildlife trade and it actually happened again. Uh, and maybe it happened several times. There was another outbreak uh, in Gangsu, another large uh, city in China in December of 2003. So, like I said, the epidemiology quickly linked uh, the, those first cases to the wildlife trade. There was a restaurant in Foshan, the city that was selling palm civets and other wildlife. Uh, they're considered delicacies, delicacies, delicacies there. I mean, people eat these wild animals. Uh, but, you know, the viruses were isolated and uh, sequenced. And um, I think one thing that's sort of become evident recently is maybe we don't know quite about as much of about the, the spillover of this virus originally. We, you know, we know it came through a couple of different wild animal species. We know wild uh, life markets, uh, wet, so-called wet markets were involved. Uh, but you know, in terms of the genetics of the virus, I mean, this may be, uh, you know, we may need to take a second look at that. Because uh, the original paper, and I know you can't read it because it's probably too small, but there were differences uh, in the animal isolates from the human isolates. In fact, uh, human isolates had some deletions in them. And so, you know, that, that I think deserves a second look. So here's just a bigger map of China that, that talks about several of these beta coronaviruses that have emerged. And they've emerged uh, exclusively in these large Chinese cities. Uh, so, you know, the first SARS I mentioned in Fushan, and then the second SARS outbreak that I mentioned too, both of these, uh, you know, linked to the wildlife trade. And then there's another virus that was on that, that earlier slide there, a Hong Kong University One virus, that actually uh, was first detected in 2004. And again, it emerged in a very large uh, city, 18 million people. In fact, you know, this area down here in China is the world's largest urban area. It includes Hong Kong. There are a lot of mega cities there. It's a, a really a lot of people living there. And then, you know, no different really in some sense. The 11 million people in Wuhan, uh, another large uh, Chinese city. And this is where the, of course, the SARS-2 emerged. And so there's been a lot of talk, some consternation. I mean, the people that believe that the virus leaked from a lab, you know, will point to the fact that, you know, that these mines and things where some viruses have been isolated that are close to SARS-CoV-2, uh, the famous RATG-13, which is 96% uh, similar to SARS-2, uh, was isolated in this mine down here in southern China. I'll talk about this virus uh, in some detail, this Banal 2052 virus that is even a little bit more uh, similar to um, SARS-CoV-2, 96.8 at the nucleotide level from uh, Laos down here in um, you know, close to southern China. And people have been concerned, well, how did the virus get from this mine to Wuhan? And I would just point out that this map shows very clearly that, you know, well, it got there somehow. And, you know, in the first SARS, if you believe that it came from these mines here, had to go almost a similar distance to get over to uh, you know, to Fushan and, and Gangzhou back in 2002 and 2003 for the first SARS. But, um, you know, I, I think that's a little short-sighted and there's a lot of misinformation out there. And in, in fact, China has a lot of caves. Uh, there's a, a huge limestone formations all across China, uh, multiple caves, many things, including in uh, Hubei province, which is the province where uh, the city, uh, the mega city of, of Wuhan is located. And in fact, right next to um, 
the city of Wuhan in a, in a old part of Hubei province called Inshi, uh, there are multiple caves. There's this huge cave called the Flying Dragon Cave that is 37 miles long. Um, and people will tell you there are no bats there. Well, you know, there are bats there. There are at least seven types of horseshoe bats uh, that are uh, in Western Hubei province. Uh, a, a massive cave, people going in, in and out of this cave. It's a, it looks like a beautiful place. I'd like to go there myself. But the other point uh, about Hubei province is, is that there um, are numerous farms nearby to Wuhan, in the, particularly in this area called Inchi. And, and that's primarily the work of this uh, reporter from the Washington and Post, he published this article, Michael Standard, who looked at, um, you know, these numerous caves, but also the small farms that had housed literally hundreds and thousands of wild mammals, like, like the civets, like the ferret badgers, like raccoon dogs, uh, who um, are, we know now, are susceptible to uh, SARS-1 and also SARS-2. So, so these animals were actually here uh, in, in Hubei province. And the viruses are there too. And, and this is actually a nice map uh, from the New York Times which shows some of the new viruses that have been isolated since the SARS-2 pandemic. People have continued to look. Uh, viruses that are closely related uh, or SARS related actually. Uh, beta coronaviruses have been isolated from uh, pangolins in a couple of different provinces in China. Um, there, of course, is the RITG13, but there are other viruses up here that are, have been isolated that are actually closer to Wuhan. In fact, you know, the caves are spread all throughout this area, and we believe the viruses are too. And they, they, it's not just China. It's down here further into Southeast Asia. So I mentioned the Banal 52 and the 103. The other, other viruses are related to that in, in Laos, but, you know, viruses have been isolated from Thailand and also Cambodia that are SARS-related. They're beta coronaviruses. They're relatives of SARS-1 and SARS-2 coronaviruses. So, um, you know, uh, there are some differences uh, between the first SARS and the second uh, SARS. And um, the, the first SARS was pretty clearly uh, widely distributed uh, in wildlife before it makes it, made its jumps to humans in 2002 and 2003. And, and we know that it was no problem for the epidemiologists to go to the, uh, you know, go to the wildlife farms and, and go trap wild animals and find uh, viruses that were, uh, you know, that find SARS-1 uh, virus there. Uh, but one thing that, you know, this, this guy, this one of our colleagues here, uh, Stephen Goldstein, uh, who's at uh, University of Utah, uh, recently, you know, picked up on was is that, you know, they actually did isolate SARS-related or SARS-CoV-1 itself, actually, from farm civets outside of Wuhan back in 2005. So that little area next to, um, you know, the city of Wuhan, I, I'd encourage you to watch this space, you know, watch the what Stephen Goldstein and, and our, some of the other people that, that do follow genetics, like Christian Anderson, uh, are looking at, at, at re-looking at this original outbreak of, you know, SARS-CoV-1. And, and think about this a little bit. There are farm civets outside of Wuhan. Uh, and, um, you know, it's, it's very possible. And, and in fact, you know, I would say it's, it's uh, it, you know, it's not unlikely that actually those original civets that came from, uh, that came, came from Wuhan that infected these people down in Fushan, because there is a lot of this farming of these animals up here uh, in the city. And so, you know, like I said, watch this space. Uh, it's possible that that first outbreak of SARS did have its origins near near Wuhan City, and it's going to take a little bit more genetic sleuthing to uh, to sort that out. So, uh, you know, keeping on with the SARS uh, one, I mean, what did the people do in response to that first outbreak? And um, you know, they put in travel bans, they started wearing masks, uh, social distancing, temperature checks. Um, they supposedly stopped selling civets, but I guess they really didn't do that. I mean, the, the wildlife trade flourished uh, after SARS uh, one. And but one important thing they did was they built new labs. They they had virologists, and of course we're virologists. We we know that you know. I mean, there's an intense amount of interest in in coronaviruses, particularly in China. Uh, all the major cities in China have virologists that work on uh, SARS you know, related viruses and, you know, in Beijing and Hong Kong and in Wuhan, yes, indeed, but in other places in China too, in Yuhan province, you know, a lot of people work on coronaviruses in China because, yeah, that was a big deal back there uh, in 2002 and 2003. And one thing that they did was 
built the Wuhan Institute of Virology and plant bi biosafety level three and biosafety level four labs there. And so, you know, there is a lot of talk about, uh, you know, the fact that, you know, it's possible that the virus leaked out of this lab and it's, uh, you know, call it the lab leak hypothesis. There's been a lot of talk about gain of function research and there've been a lot of myths swirling around the Wuhan Institute of Virology. And uh, if anybody is interested, I would uh, actually recommend this article by Joshua Cho. Uh, it's in something called Mint Press News. And he talks about some of the tropes about, you know, people, being dishonest about Chinese scientists lying and things like that, and there's an undercurrent of all that uh, in the lab leak, and I, and I, you know, it's it's easy to sort of you know sort of turn and ignore that, but there is is definitely you know something going on that uh, you know people you know bring up you know race you know racist type tropes about uh, dishonest people in China in, in China lying and withholding evidence and things like that and there is no doubt that that China is an authoritarian totalitarian regime they've done a lot of bad things to their own people but you know we we as you know as scientists know that the science there is very strong and and people like Singli Shi and and others that that work there are are really terrific scientists and so you know unfortunately one of the most damaging articles that was published was published by this guy, a former reporter uh, named Nicholas Wade from the uh, New York Times. And I, I just, it, he, he wrote about, um, you know, the possible origins of, of, of COVID-19. Uh, take a minute to look at his background though, and, and then try to figure out why the New York Times actually, um, you know, fired Mr. Wade uh, for some of his other writing about genes and race and, and human history. And so, you know, the, the lab leak, you know, there are a lot of people that talk about it. There are politicians that talk about it. I'm not going to get into the politics. There are even comedians on late night television that talk about it. And no, John Stewart, um, you know, the, the virus didn't come because, you know, penguins kissed a turtle. That That is kind of funny, but, you know, it, it, this is a more of a serious subject than that. And, uh, you know, really, you shouldn't get your virology information from, from somebody like uh, John Stewart. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot, lot out there. There's, uh, you know, a lot of politicians that, that are pushing the idea that, that SARS-CoV-2 came from this lab, the Wuhan Institute of Virology, a lot of misinformation that's being passed around there. And there's, there, there are even some scientists that, you know, not very many virologists, but some scientists that, that you know, come out with, uh, you know, this idea that, well, we're, we're just asking questions. We, we think it's possible that there was a lab leak. And you, you get things like, could it, you know, could SARS-CoV-2 have been adapted uh, to humans while being studied in the lab and then accidentally escaped? And you know this this is uh, known as uh, just asking questions or jacking, uh, according to the Urban Dictionary, and it, it has some underlying assumptions that you know I mean the Urban Dictionary says they're completely insane, maybe not completely insane, but you know they they are meant to mislead and they're meant to to lead people that you know don't you know, may not understand the science uh, in a particular direction. So just asking questions is, is, is really, you know, it's been pretty damaging to the credibility of virologists and, and other people, particularly, um, you know, uh, Dr. Shi at the uh, Wuhan Institute of Virology. So the lab leak hypotheses have, have kind of undergone a, a process of de-evolution, as I call it. Um, you know, there, there have been various things. And when it was originally, you know, considered, there was a lot of people that were talking about how this was a deliberately created bioweapon. But the goalposts and things have changed. And, you know, there's also talk about gain of function experiments and things like that. And you'll, you'll hear a lot about that. Dr. Fauci uh, has been accused of funding research that has led to the death of millions. Um, and, and then there's there are simpler versions of it. Researchers just being infected in field and carrying the virus back. And that's probably where a lot of the lab leakers are now. It was just an accident. They didn't know they had it, uh, which seems a lot of, you know, a lot of thing, you know, a lot to, you know, sort of raise and talk about. And um, Biden's national intelligence report, and of course, uh, President Biden called on the intelligence community to uh, look into this. Uh, it did. It came up, you know, not 
you know, it came up with some fairly strong conclusions there, actually, if you read, actually read the report. It's been while they reported that it was kind of a, a toss-up. really wasn't much of a toss-up at all. They did actually eliminate one important thing that, you know, they said that this virus was not created as a bioweapon. They also said a few other things like, you know, the Chinese didn't know that it was there in the country before the pandemic and other, other important things. So, so read the origins report there of the intelligence community. I think, you know, you'll get a different impression if you actually read it as compared to reading some of the news. So I, I want to talk about, you know, the lab leak hypothesis. And, you know, I, I'll mention Alice here because she's one of my favorites, you know, and here she is with the Red Queen. Uh, and the Red Queen is admonishing her because she wants her to believe in impossible things. Uh, and, you know, if you're a lab leaker, I think you have to believe in quite a few impossible things to, to believe that this virus actually leaked from the lab there at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. One thing you have to believe is that, the, that SARS-CoV-2 or its direct progenitor was there in, in the Institute before the pandemic. And, and if you believe number one there, then you, know, you, you have two versions that you can believe of number two. You either think that they conspired to keep it secret, you know, that they had the virus and they didn't tell anybody about it. And then a lot of people kept that you know, away from the rest of the world. Or you know, this sort of lab leak light uh, hypothesis that they didn't know they had it, that somehow they didn't have it. And then unknowingly somebody got infected it, with it in the lab. Uh, or maybe a bat cave while they were collecting virus. So you also have to believe that SARS-2 came directly from a bat to a human. And this is a possibility that we actually considered early on, but the new data actually suggests that, you know, there probably had to be an intermediate host. It didn't come directly from a bat to a human. And this is important because, you know, basically the Wuhan Institute of Virology collects samples from bats and if, you know, but not these other animals. And, and so other people will tell you, and I hope I've, uh, you know, sort of addressed that possibility that, you know, there's no way that SARS-CoV-2 could have gotten from the bat caves in southern China to Wuhan uh, over, it's actually a thousand kilometers, not a hundred kilometers away. And, uh, and then somehow later it was carried from the lab to, to these wet markets in Wuhan. And so you have to also believe if you're a lab leaker that it's simply a coincidence that just like the first SARS that most of those early cases of COVID-19 in Wuhan were linked to the wildlife trade, not just in one wet market, but in multiple wet markets in the city of Wuhan. And then the big one, of course, is number six. You have to believe that the fact that the Wuhan Institute of Virology is in Wuhan, where the outbreak started, trumps every other fact. Okay, so I, I, I just want to be a little bit clear here. Uh, I mean, if you believe that the, the Wuhan Institute of Virology had SARS-CoV-2, and was working on it before the pandemic. And a lot of people have alleged that. You'll hear about you know, gain of function research and grants and things to put in pure and cleavage sites and all that. Then you have to believe that, that our colleague, Professor Shi, who is part of the GDN, and her collaborators, people like Lin Fuan Wang, uh, are just incredibly gifted at lying to people. Uh, and that many of their colleagues here, and you know, these people don't look like the type that you know, are, you know, the evil scientist type, they actually look, you know, like a lot of intelligent people that are really enthusiastic about what they do. But you have to believe that their colleagues are basically involved in a conspiracy and a cover up and it would be the biggest conspiracy and cover up of, you know, of, of our lifetime, certainly, but probably in the past thousand years. Okay, so some other data. So there are actually data about this. There, uh, there is no data to support the lab leak. The only piece of data, the only fact is, is that the Wuhan Institute of Virology is in the city of Wuhan. Uh, but you know, there is also good data that you know supports the natural origin of SARS-CoV-2. It did not direct jump from bats to people. And, and I can say that with, with some assurance because of this new virus, this banal 52 virus that was isolated from a bat in Wuhan. Uh, at the amino acid level, this, this virus is extremely similar to SARS-CoV-2. It has to be, uh, if not the proximal origin, at least very closely related to it. And this, and, and what happened was, uh, you know, it's, it's dissimilar at the nucleotide level. It's only 96.8% similar at the nucleotide level. But at the protein level, you know, those proteins are set. They're, they're very similar, 96 and 98, 99% similar 
at the, uh, at the protein level, uh, but the codons have been adapted. And it, well, what this tells us is, is that the, the virus actually jumped from bats. It's no longer a bat virus. It's a virus that was adapted to another species. And, and then all it took was getting that furin cleavage site to turn it into you know, what is basically an ideal pathogen. So this part of the slide over here basically shows the amino acid identity of SARS-CoV-2 and this banal 2052 virus very, very close across all the proteins. It is essentially the progenitor of SARS-CoV-2, and that's, a, that's pretty obvious. So we actually, um, my colleagues and I uh, wrote this paper that you've probably read, and a lot of people have read this paper called The Proximal Origin of SARS-CoV-2 uh, back in uh, Nature Medicine that we published in 2020. Eddie Holmes, uh, actually down here in the left-hand corner, uh, was one is basically primarily responsible for getting that sequence released early on. Uh, and, and we were able to look at this paper uh, and, and, and draw some fairly firm conclusions that the virus was not engineered as a bioweapon. Uh, and, uh, and that uh, conclusion, I think, is held up. It's been supported by the intelligence community and other people like that. And a lot of the other things that we talked about in that uh, Proximal Origins paper have actually uh, come to, uh, shown to be true, too. So basically what we talked about there was, uh, you know, some of the, the SARS-related viruses that had been uh, known at the time. Uh, this pangolin virus had just been isolated in the late 2019, nobody really knew much about it. Uh, and then this RATG13 virus from this, um, this uh, intermediate horseshoe bat here, the Rhinolophus affinis bat. Um, we wish we would have known about the new virus, the banal 52 virus, uh, you know, the Malaysian horseshoe bat, but you know, it had not been isolated until 2020. So we looked at the genome, uh, the genome that Eddie got uh, put on the uh, virological.org site uh, and, and saw, you know, these unusual features. And, and the first unusual feature, of course, is this famous furin cleavage site here, this polybasic site, the PRRA insertion that gives you the RRAR furin cleavage site. I mean, this, this is the furin cleavage site that makes this virus very transmissible. You would expect a pandemic virus to have a insertion or something like this that makes it transmissible. And unfortunately, this virus did. And when I saw that virus, you know, like on, you know, January 12th, when I first saw the sequence, you know, that was, you know, the first thing I noticed that this virus had a furin cleavage site. But we also looked uh, in our proximal origins paper at the uh, receptor binding domain, this, this part of the sequence down here, the, the part that actually makes the virus what I would call pantropic. And we'll talk, I'll talk about that more in just a little bit. And, you know, this is uh, nearly identical in this banal 2052. It makes it, you know, pretty clear that this virus was not adapted. You have a virus has a nearly identical receptor binding domain isolated in 2020, but that means that nobody at the Boyd Plant Institute of Virology turned that receptor binding domain by, you know, by uh, gain of function or, you know, anything into SARS-CoV-2. So it's really the dagger in the heart of some of the, a large part of the lab leak theories. So we know about bird flu, the H9 and H7 variants that get this furin cleavage site. Virologists know that that was a very dangerous thing to have. But you know, other people looking at the furin cleavage site, you know, saw something unusual. Uh, you know, and and there's there's been some you know pretty bad opinion pieces written and some very misleading things that I don't really have much time to go in about. Uh, you know, this guy, David Baltimore, definitely a generational scientist, uh, you know, has made some incredible contributions to science, but, you know, his quote in that Nicholas Wade piece was really damaging to, you know, the credibility of virologists. What he said was, is that there's, this insertion is entirely for, foreign to beta coronaviruses. I mean, that's just false. It's not true. I mean, beta coronaviruses have, um, you know, a lot of furin cleavage sites. So SARS is the only one, of course, in the sub subgenus Sarbico virus, but MERS virus has a beta, has a, a furin cleavage site. And viruses like OC43 and Hong Kong University One, I mentioned those before, they have really great furin cleavage sites. And even this, you know, this bat virus, Sabico virus, is, you know, some of those, not all, some have furin cleavage sites. And there are other features of this furin cleavage site that make make it obvious to a virologist that this was not somehow engineered into the, into the virus. I mean, it has um, 
O-link glycan near it. Nobody knew that, you know, furin cleavage sites in coronaviruses had O-link glycans near them, but they're present in these other viruses. And so how would you know to, you know, put in just the right sequence to generate an O-link glycan to make it, you know, under the proper regulation? The other thing is, is that, you know, that furin cleavage site, those 12 nucleotides are inserted out of frame. Uh, I mean, which 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 science who which scientists would do that? Not your worst graduate student or postdoc would put you know 12 nucleotides in to create a furin cleavage site and then put those 12 nucleotides out of frame. Now we can't tell if it's in the minus one or the minus two reading frame, but it's put in out of frame. That that's fairly obvious. And you can tell that by looking uh, at the at these codons, you know, you can tell what the reading frame is uh, pretty easily. And so the bat virus RTG13 differs, you know, at what we call the wobble codons here. And you can set the reading frame pretty easily there. Now, one thing I mentioned earlier was is that banal 52 is a code, it, you know, also was a, a virus that, you know, um, might, might be considered one of the precursors of SARS-CoV-2. And that if you look at those wobble codons, if you look at, you know, the, um, you know, the third basis in the sequence, you can tell that clearly banal 52 is a bat virus. In fact, in this little area that, you know, we put into our cell paper on the furin cleavage site, it is identical to SARS-CoV-2. It has all the wobble codons of a bat coronavirus that, you know, have been changed in SARS-CoV-2. So, SARS-CoV-2, you know, emerged from another species, not a bat, uh, in, into humans. That's pretty clear. So a little bit of time left here to talk about the crime scene there in uh, in um, in Wuhan. Let's let's go in. Let's it is a crime scene. Let's actually go in there. This is the a non seafood market in Wuhan tied to a lot of those first COVID nineteen infections. And you have to know a little bit about the city of Wuhan. It's a large, incredibly beautiful city, but it's it's dominated by the Zhangxi River that. Uh, Changsi River that runs through it. And you can see it's a massive river. I mean, we have a large river here uh, in New Orleans too, the Mississippi River. But, you know, the Huan, Hanan Seafood Market is up here on one side of the river, the Wuhan Institute of Virology down here, uh, about uh, 15 miles away or so from uh, that Hanan market. And so what were people actually seeing early on uh, in the uh, city of Wuhan when this coronavirus started to emerge? And there's been a lot of talk, there's been a lot of criticism of WHO about, you know, uh, how they at first thought that there was no clear evidence of human to human transmission. The WHO has created a lot of heat. I just want to re remind people that, you know, pandemics are, are you know, are volatile situations. There's a lot of bad information that gets pushed around, like, you know, how many bottles of hand sanitizer did you buy? What do we hear about, you know, oh no, this is not an aerosolized virus and, you know, and mask, you know, they're limited in effectiveness. I mean, there's a lot of bad information that you can get early on in a pandemic. And so, yes, there was a lot of market exposure, a lot of wildlife early on uh, in the city of Wuhan. All the, many of the early cases, most of them were linked to this Hanan seafood market. And recently, more recently, we've taken a look at some of this early epidemiological data. Uh, we've looked at where these cases are clustered. They were actually all clustered early on around this uh, Hanan seafood market. And, um, and, and later on, when you start to see the deaths showing up, they were all clustered on this opposite side of the river, the north side of the river here uh, in this part of the city. And then they spread out, the cases spread out, the deaths spread out uh, over time. So this early epidemiological data all, all links things to this Hanan seafood market. And so this guy, Mike Warby, uh, is actually going to have perspective come out. You can probably see it tomorrow. Uh, Mike you know, talks in that perspective about, you know, of all the places in Wuhan that sell things like civets, how could all these early cases be linked to it? So definitely watch out for the piece from Mike Warby. Uh, he'll talk about some of those early cases the, at the Wuhan Central Hospital right near the uh, the Hanan Market. They have a couple camp campuses of that hospital and, the, you know, some of the early patients showed up within blocks of the um, 
of the Henan market here and, and this other market that, that may also be uh, have some role in the outbreak. And, and also at this other hospital that, you know, all within about a one square mile area of the city that's over 500 square miles. This is where the early cases were all showing up near, near this market that sold these wildlife uh, cases. So very important preprint coming. Look at they were they were clearly shut down the market because they were they thought that this is what they were seeing they were seeing animal to human transmission, and 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 you know we know that human to human transmission occurs, um, and and so um, you know this is from the CDC the Chinese CDC early all evidence points to wild animals sold legal, illegally at that market, and so they shut the market down that was the right thing to do from a public hint health standpoint. And they also took some environmental samples. They swabbed for PCR. They did some sequencing on those. They got some virus there. And, and I want to just point out, and it's, there's, there is misinformation out there, that there actually, we do know about this market. We know where they were selling wildlife. We know where, we know which stalls in the market were selling the wildlife. They were being sold up here, this part of the market. They were being sold on the western heart, half of the market here. I want to point to this one stall here that uh, actually has the the, um, the uh, uh, PCR positivity in it. And it also is a place where they're selling wildlife. And my colleague here, Eddie Holmes, actually went to that very stall uh, back in 2014. Uh, and he was told that the Hanan market was a place of pandemic risk at least five years before uh, COVID emerged. And, and another thing that you might have heard that is actually misinformation and the WHO team was misinformed about that, there were actually wild animals being sold there. There were raccoon dogs and other animals that were being sold uh, at this market. And this only became uh, evident with this scientific reports paper uh, that came out after the pandemic was over. And, and, and we know that wildlife was sold there. There are just so many examples of this. There was a CNN report, uh, some private footage that was shown I mentioned the Zhao Zhao paper about the that came out in scientific reports, but other people, including Eddie Holmes, had gone there and taken pictures of raccoon dogs. Animal rights activists had gone to this market and taken pictures of raccoon dogs, which are susceptible to SARS-CoV-2. And this menu of species that were being sold at the market was being circulated on the internet just months before the the wild before the pandemic started. And they was basically a who's who of animals that are susceptible to SARS-CoV-2. And, and here's, here's one of the places I, I showed on that earlier slide uh, where the wildlife was being sown. This, this Chinese menu basically says wild animals. And here it is again uh, on the stalls in the, in the Henan market. We know where these uh, animals were being sold, um, you know, and I just want to point to this one place. And we know about those environmental samples. On this slide, they're all in blue here. And so look at the blue boxes here. They're all kind of centered around this uh, stall here that Eddie Holmes found them selling raccoon dogs. So there is a clustering of these cases. Um, in the Hanan market, I give a little credit to one of the internet sleuths, this guy named Barbar, uh, that that found some of this information. But you know, this is the place where these um, raccoons and other wildlife are being sold. So, you know, that was the only stall there in the market where we had multiple environmental samples being positive. So, watch watch for this. There'll be more information on them. Like I said, watch the space. Uh, we, there, we know more about some of those samples there. This really is a smoking gun. This tells you that there were infected animals at the Hanan market, uh, including raccoon dogs and things like that. Okay, so uh, another, um, you know, an, another thing about the virus, and I think it's almost, I, I mean, I will wrap up with this, but, uh, you know, uh, another um, young lady going to a wild place, the land of Oz, and, you know, one of her catchphrases, lions and tigers and bears, well, it's actually deers that are important. Uh, we, we've known, if you just look at the head, headlines, you know, you see that SARS-CoV-2 uh, is not well adapted to humans. So, you know, one of the prominent lab leakers has, has speculated on that, uh, tried to publish a paper on it. Uh, but there have actually been uh, a lot of human to animal spillovers. This virus is a pantropic virus. It can infect multiple different species. And we've seen snow leopards die in zoos, and we've seen lions die. We've seen other animals in zoos getting infected. They're getting infected by humans into animal spillovers. This virus doesn't really care which species it's in. There have been actually 
about 450 mink farms worldwide that have had to be shut down in 12 countries. This virus will jump species uh, basically at will. And we've kept track of some of the uh, some of the mutations that occur in SARS as it jumps to these different species. And they're at the places that you'd expect. They're near the furin cleavage site. They're near the receptor binding domain. Some of the mutations are in the interminal domain, which is actually also involved in entry of the virus. And so you can see the changes as the virus makes. So yeah, the, one of the more interesting things is the spillback from humans to white-tailed deer. And you know, basically, they caught deer uh, they've been catching deer for the chronic wasting disease surveillance program for quite some time. And they found uh, that this percentage increased uh, almost 100% of deer in Iowa that they, that they trapped were positive for SARS-CoV-2. And it really correlated very well with the, the, uh, you know, the emergence of SARS-CoV-2 in, uh, in Iowa. Um, and it were and, and it's the same sequences in the deer and in the people if you look at the actual sequences of the virus. So this is spilling back from humans to animals. How does that happen? Well, people and deer interact. And I would also say that it's not just Iowa. People have collected at the USDA a lot of samples from deer in places like Illinois, Michigan, New York, and Pennsylvania. Uh, they're all positive. You know, a lot of them are positive too. A pretty good percentage of them are. So again, this virus just jumps easily from people to people. And I uh, speculated a, a, you know, several months ago that you know, maybe there were um, have been several jumps, uh, you know, not just from people to animals, but from animals to people. Uh, it's a possible ability, a way to explain why there are different lineages of SARS-CoV-2. Of course, you've heard about all the, the B viruses and the A viruses. Well, you know, did the virus jump twice to people? I think there's actually some evolving evidence for that. You know, there's actually no true intermediates between lineage A and lineage B viruses, which you'd expect. If that shift happened in people, it could have happened in animals. So human to human, human to animal, animal to human, probably animal to animal too, explains a lot of how this emerged. And once the virus gets into a population, as we saw in New Orleans, it can do things like super spreading. It can go wildly from person to person, and, and it happens the same in other populations too, like, for example, the deer population. So it's a highly generalist virus. Uh, it, you know, once it picked up that furin cleavage site, it probably already had a pretty good RBD. Uh, the virus became highly infectious, able to jump species easily. I think one of the reasons why we haven't seen a lot of virus in the wildlife is because is that transition happened very quickly. Once it picked up the RBD, it was able to reach the human population via, via the wildlife trade pretty quickly. So, you know, a virus like SARS-1, you know, had time to spread around in the different populations and different animals. Uh, but, you know, SARS-CoV-2, once it picked up that fear and cleavage site, uh, it was almost inevitable that it jumped into people pretty, pretty quickly. And it's probably explains why we haven't seen uh, the intermediates like we did more easily with that first SARS. So um, to close up, I mean, you know, we've seen spillover. The spillover virus had a pretty good RBD in furin cleavage site. These are getting better, as we've seen with the successive waves, with the first with the D614G wave, then the alpha wave, then the delta wave that we're all experiencing now. And unfortunately, it looks like cases are going up again. I'm not quite sure what's going on there. Maybe one of the delta plus variants uh, is, is making some headway. Uh, I think that's TBD. Uh, but um, you know, this is this uh, virus, um, you know, very likely emerged from nature. And, you know, I think people like Bob Gallo would, would probably remember some of the controversies about the origin of, of HIV back in the early days. And it really is like deja vu over again. I mean, this, this guy, Edward Hooper, you know, talks a lot about you know, how our, the virus probably was from a, from a lab or something like that. One more lost girl to talk about, Wendy in Neverland. Um, you know, uh, please don't give these internet sleuths and other lab leakers encouragement. I mean, they're, they are um, kind of breaking up and deconstructing themselves uh, anyway. Uh, the, if you've heard of Drastic, they're, they're broken up, but, um, you know, they're, they're kind of like, you know, Wendy, she didn't want to grow up. She just wanted to maybe stay in her basement and scour the internet like, like some of these other people. And so I, I have to give some credit to my team of uh, Zonati's um, for a lot of this work. And, and stay tuned, there's a lot more to come.
Christian, I'm done. Maybe ran over a little bit from what you'd like, but uh, this is my that was my last slide. Thank you so much. No, no, this is great, absolutely great, and uh, exactly actually consistent with what uh, the DVN is about. I mean, it's about uh, restoring facts and providing real expertise and uh, also congratulations for great slides. I mean, that's, that's really the best, uh, I would say, overall summary. Uh, I believe that we have ever seen, I mean, regarding this uh, major topic and uh, this, if you agree, I mean, these slides can be extremely useful uh, to, uh, to post maybe, uh, and uh, that, that, that's a great, great advice. Yeah, no, it, it's true. There's been a lot of attacks on virology, virologists, yeah. people like Dr. Xi. It's very unfortunate. It's very anti-science. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I, I really do think we need to fight this with facts, science, and you know, exactly. the science is definitely on our side. <laughs> no, but that's, a, that, that's a great example. That's absolutely fantastic. So we will move to some questions and uh, you can see them on the chat, I guess, Bob. Uh, let's see, I'm stopping the sharing now, so maybe I can see the chat. Uh, hey, you can read it. Uh, I actually don't see any questions yet, which is fine. Uh, we have not received any question yet. No, no, but there is something on the chat. Uh, yeah, it's sorry. just for the general comment. Uh, chat. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you for an informative talk. Thank you very much, Baruch. <laughs> yeah. That was not a question. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, no, I, I, I believe that I would like to start with uh, just following up on these, uh, these viruses which have been discovered at the border between Laos, Vietnam, and so on that you have referred. That's really very, very informative. Do we have other information uh, on the dissemination of these viruses outside of these areas? I mean, is it really something which has been only confined with these places or is there some evidence that they would have spread and also to uh, other animals? Yeah, most definitely there's a lot more of that work to be done. I mean, we need to see has it spread to, other, has a virus like banal, 52, are there viruses like that in animals, say in Laos or Vietnam or Cambodia there? I mean, that, there may be, uh, and, and we need to do that kind of work. We need to, to go out yeah. and sample those animals. It can be done safely. I mean, there's a lot of talk about, you know, you have proposals out there where they, they want to send virologists to some deserted island somewhere and, and stop, you know, stop any field work and, and stop learning about these viruses. And I don't think that's the right approach. I mean, I think these labs can operate safely. They should be, uh, you know, they, they've been operating safely. There's no evidence that for a lab leak, no evidence whatsoever that this virus leaked from the Wuhan Institute of Virology or any other lab there. Uh, we need to keep doing this work because it does keep us, it will keep us safer uh, in the future. Yeah, and uh, these viruses, as you, as you very nicely presented, are key players in the conversation. I mean, because they have the shift from the only uh, previous, uh, I would say, presumed ancestors to actually a category of virus. So that would be very important. We have several questions now coming. Yeah, thanks. So um, yeah, I see from uh, Konstantin Chimikov, thank you for the question. I mean, codon usage adaptation. Yeah, I mean, it's clear that, um, you know, Bengal 52 is a, is a bat virus and you can look at the codon usage there. Can we tell which animal it actually came from to get to SARS-CoV-2? That's more difficult. We can tell that SARS-CoV-2 is probably not a bat virus anymore per se, uh, it's at least been adapting uh, to some other species at least, or to generally spe to generalist species to, to a lot of different mammals, mostly carnivores, uh, but pinpointing down the, the, you know, the exact animal through codon usage is gonna be, be pretty tough. Um, 
Okay. So you, uh, you have several. Uh, if you go from the beginning, you have one from Anders. How does Ebola stay latent, or is it persistent? Okay. Ah, okay. Yeah. Uh, that is an excellent question. I mean, I, I considered that in that little perspective that I wrote for, for Nature there. We don't know. I mean, the, the virus clearly is doing it. I mean, is it just slow replication or does it have some more, uh, you know, something else that it's doing that just allows it to, uh, you know, stay in immunologically privileged sites like the eye or the central nervous system. I wish I knew the answer to that. Uh, it's definitely something that needs to be researched. We need to figure out, you know, how does the virus go latent? I do think there is something with, with the immune system. Once your sort of antibodies or T cells wane, it may allow the virus to reemerge. And so that, that's why we're thinking that, um, you know, vaccination of survivors might be a good way to keep their immunity up and keep, keep that virus from coming back back at up. Uh, so Ray wants to know, thank you, Dr. Shinazi, what to expect after COVID-2? Well, I think it's not unlikely to expect maybe COVID-3 <laughs> and COVID-4. Uh, what will that look like? Well, that's, that's hard to know. I mean, um, coronaviruses are very uh, undersampled in, in bats and other animals. There are just many of them out there. I mean, as you know, I mean, bats are some of the most diverse uh, animals on the planet and they carry diverse coronaviruses, but maybe it won't be a coronavirus. I'm a little worried about uh, paramyxoviruses, for example. We have some pretty nasty ones like HEPA and Hindra, uh, Nipah and Hindra, uh, you know, it could be that. I mean, you know, um, Pox viruses. I don't think we're, you know, we're totally out of the woods with with pox viruses either. And then arena viruses. Uh, we saw Lujo emerged, um, you know, a very deadly virus, 80% case fatality rate. I mean, what other arena viruses are looking uh, there that that could spill over? So Dr. Gillow just joined the panelist. Yeah. Yeah, you have another question from Glenn Richard. Besides, can you see it besides mink? Is yeah, there, is there evidence of animal to human transmission? Uh, well, I mean, the first, the first transmission, I think, you know, from um, that stall in the non-market, I think that's going to be pretty conclusive. Uh, but, you know, you're going to have to wait for the evidence as we sort of accumulate that and get that together and, and, um, and, and present that in a, in a way that's going to be, I think, pretty bulletproof. It's going to show that that you know there had to be an animal there in the market transmitting to people. Did it happen more than once? Uh, I think that's a possibility. That'll be harder to prove, though. Mm -hmm. um, but but um, yeah, yeah uh, we we actually did see you know spill over to the minks. Yeah, and and it spilled back to people. Uh, so far, we haven't seen any of those gorillas or lions or tigers spill back to a person, at least that we know of, but it's certainly a possibility. People are warning about the deer. Uh, they're warning people that hunt deer that a lot of them may actually be carrying the SARS coronavirus. Uh, I think if it's gonna happen, uh, you know, gonna observe it there, it probably will be uh, in people that are, you know, that are going out and, and hunting these uh, white-tailed deer and thing in the US because a you. lot of them are infected. And you have a, a question from David Ostrov. Can you see? It? Okay. Yeah. Uh, yes. The pangolin viruses. Um, so, I mean, the pangolin viruses, at least the ones that, that have been sampled so far, are more distantly related to SARS CoV 2. Um, you know, they're not nearly as closely related as, say, that Banal 52 virus or, or some of the other bat viruses. One of them, the one from Guangdong, has a, a very similar RBD. Uh, and, and, you know, the, the evolution of that is, um, I think, not 100% clear. I, Andrew Rambo has taken a pretty good look. It's, it's probably, you know, it, it probably, you know, picked it up. There, certainly there's been some recombination in things over time, but the, the pangolin viruses, at least the ones so far, are not close enough to have been the direct progenitor. Now, there are pangolins all over the place you know, all over Africa and, and Asia too. So we need to keep sampling those pangolin viruses too. And the final question, I believe that you have already addressed actually, which is based on the information, is it possible to predict the future of the disease and the pandemic? 
Well, I mean, I, you know, uh, every time I predict it, I'm probably wrong. <laughs> I, I do think that we, we have some more tricks that SARS-CoV-2 can pull out. I mean, the fear and cleavage site is not yet optimal. <laughs> uh, receptor binding domain is pretty good. The, the next phase, as we hopefully get more and more people vaccinated, might be some, you know, some um, epitopic changes that, you know, make the virus resistant to the immune system. That's that's a possibility that we we can't discount now. We're going to have to keep ahead of this virus uh, with with the vaccination, with with changing the vaccine, perhaps to to maybe account for some of the uh, immune escape variants that that might be the next phase of this. Uh, definitely, getting rid of it uh, seems not to be going to be possible. If it can jump into deers, it can jump into a lot of other species. There are going to be animal reservoirs for it. Uh, I don't think, you know, even if we figure out some way to 100% immunize the human population, we're, we're not going to get rid of the virus. We have two other questions, then we will have to stop. I mean, we, it's a fascinating topic and you are generating a lot of interest. But uh, so you have one on the, the role of uh, other SARS gene. Do you see it, Dr. Alan? Yeah, I see it as, yeah. Um, you know, I, I think the gain of function research, we need, we can talk about lab safety, it's fine. But, you know, if you're going to do gain of function research you and, and create SARS-CoV-2, you have to have something that's close enough to SARS-CoV-2 to change its function, right? You can't just create, you know, you can't take RATG13 or even Banal52 and mix it together with some other virus, say the pangolin virus, and create, you know, SARS-CoV-2. You can't take you know, one of these viruses that's clearly a bat virus like Banal 52 and just passage it in human cells or passage it in animals and create SARS-CoV-2. That's not going to happen. So, so these, you have to, if, if you believe that it was gain of function, then you have to also believe that, you know, they had the, basically the, the progenitor of SARS-CoV-2, everything like SARS-CoV-2, except that fear and cleavage site. And there's really no evidence for that whatsoever. Thank you. Uh, Bob is wants to ask a question. Please, Bob. Um, uh. Yeah, uh, but before Bob, I mean, maybe because there is, a, uh, we have to stop the questions after we will give the floor to Bob, but uh, I understand that it's frustrating because everybody wants to ask questions, <laughs> which is nice, uh, but um, Alan was, says, I wasn't asking about gain of function. I was inquiring about molecular epidemiology. I believe that there are two questions, actually. One is, is the role of other SARS genes in the... Uh, uh, okay. Yeah. So, and, and, Alan, and, and, I was answering was somebody a, else's yeah. question there. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, and so let me answer your question. Um, Spike mutations, no you mean that? We'll do other search. Okay, yeah, most definitely. I, I think that's a really good point. I mean, we focused on spike because uh, it has the fear and cleavage site, the RBD, it has the NTD, uh, and those mutations are clearly playing a role as this virus is, is adapting to the human uh, population. Uh, but, you know, uh, I think there was just an excellent paper from, uh, from Jennifer Data on the nuclear protein. We know that there are some changes there that could possibly be uh, contributing to, you know, these variants of concern, how they might be spreading a little better, uh, too. So we need to, you know, sort of step back maybe and expand uh, and look at, at some of the other proteins, too. We're thinking about it. Some of the early changes uh, in the, uh, in the, um, RNA dependent RNA polymerase uh, that don't get a lot of uh, talk. I mean, those those were were probably critical for uh, making this virus also uh, spread, you know, pretty easily in the human population. So we've looked at a few of those. Some of those have been characterized from the bat uh, to the uh, from the you know the bat virus or the intermediate species to humans. There were probably some changes in the RNA dependent RNA polymerase that made it spread a little bit better in people. Thank you so much again. Uh, that has been a great, great presentation on a major topic, very much consistent with, again with the spirit of this webinar. So thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for attending. And uh, we will follow up on all these uh, fascinating questions. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Bye-bye.